Now we're going to start videos on chapter 7, which is the beginning of part 3 of the textbook. So the first part, well, I mean, the first part we covered was called part 2, the causes of environmental degradation, and part 3 is called decision making in the environment. And the first chapter in this part is chapter 7, cost benefit thinking. We'll talk about cost benefit thinking. Um, we're not going to start with cost benefit thinking, because what I want to start with is the general question of how should societies make decisions and impress upon you that it's not easy to figure out optimal ways for a society to make decisions. You might think that well we should uh, vote but it turns out there are lots of different voting methods and they can result in different decisions being made even if people's preferences are exactly the same. So that's the first topic: is is um, how do how do we un how can we understand the difficulty of making social decisions? What I have on the screen now, let me move it, is uh, an excerpt from Exam One of Spring 2011, and you can see up above on the upper left that the title is The Error and Possibility Theorem and the Condorcet Paradox. So that's what we're going to start talking about. And the reason I'm pulling up the old exam is because I had things typed out for the exam question. So it's, uh, it's question number two that's relevant here, not question number one. And, and the topic here is the Error and Possibility Theorem. So Kenneth Arrow was a Nobel laureate economist. He taught for many years at Stanford. And he asked the following question, which is really a political science question. Um, it's uh, now understood to be an economics question at well, but when he was writing, economists really hadn't thought much about these topics. He wanted to write down the characteristics of a perfect social decision rule. And he came up with these five criteria, A, B, C, D, E, as the, the, the sort of minimal criteria that, a, that you would want a social decision rule to have. Now, a social decision rule means a way of taking the preferences of the individuals that make up the society about a decision, like whether you want A or B, and then society deciding whether to choose A or B. The first characteristic Arrow suggested that we would want oops, that we would want a social decision rule to have is it should be complete, which means that society ought to be able to either say that society prefers A to B, or say that society prefers B to A, or say that society is indifferent between them. Now, I'm using a mathematical symbol here which is this. So this symbol, it's not a greater than symbol. It means that society prefers A to B. Now the difference between that and this, that we say that in the second one, society strictly prefers A to B, which means that you know for sure that society likes A better than B. Well, the S subscript here stands for society, so it's society who makes this decision. In the first expression, we say that society weakly prefers A to B, which means there's a possibility that society doesn't care which one you pick, A or B, they might be equal. So in this sense, the notation is very similar to the notation for the real line, greater than or equal to or greater than, but we're talking about society choosing A or B, so we don't want to use exactly the same symbol as we use for real numbers, so we make these lines curved rather than, rather than straight. So what I said for completeness is that either society weakly prefers A to B or society weakly prefers B to A. If you didn't have completeness, then the social decision rule would sometimes not be able to make a decision. And so we'd like 
we, we like the the decision rule to be sometimes this is called decisive that is that it makes a decision all right how about b b is called responsive to individual preferences if society prefers a to b and then some individuals ranking of a goes up and no individuals ranking of a goes down then it's still the case that society prefers a to b so this uh, this demands well it's called responsive to individual preferences it demands that society makes decisions based on the preferences of the individuals in society so if the individuals in society change their mind in a way that makes more of them like a and and less of them go the other way then society's uh, if society picked a before it's going to still pick a so that also seems to be actually a very weak uh, requirement all right next next one is not in position if a is preferred to be by someone so if a is preferred to be is true for someone and b is preferred to a is true for no one then society is going to pick a so not in position means you're not imposing preferences from outside of society you're taking the preferences of the people who live in the society in this case it's somewhat similar to b so if if um if there's some people that like A, that strictly like A better than B, and nobody strictly likes B better than A, then society's going to go for A. Right. Next one. Oh, let me erase this. Yeah. Next one. Non-dictatorship. It's not. Tr the following is not true. That society picks A over B if and only if individual I picks A over B. So you see I've got got a, a somewhat different symbol here. Let me write it down. I have this symbol. Okay, this means person I is making the decision, not society S. So this says person I prefers A to B. This is weak preference here person I weakly prefers A to B. So what non-dictatorship says is society doesn't make the rule that says that person I is a dictator and we're just going to do everything the person I wants. So not uh, again, non-dictatorship seems to be a pretty weak requirement. And finally, and this is actually a little bit more controversial, independence of irrelevant alternatives. If society picks A over B, when the choices are A, B, and C, then society is still going to pick A over B when the choices are just A and B alone. So C here is an irrelevant. If you're asking do you want A or B, C is irrelevant. C is, I shouldn't say that. C is the irrelevant, so-called irrelevant alternative. So society goes for A over B when C is another possible choice then if you take C away society is still going to prefer A over B. Now you might wonder at this point what's the why did Kenneth Arrow win the Nobel Prize for writing down these five conditions? These seem to be fairly obvious fairly innocuous. Uh, yes it would seem that you would want a social decision rule to have these five properties. Well, what he won the Nobel Prize for was proving mathematically that these five properties are internally contradictory. In other words, what he proved is that it is impossible to have a social decision rule that satisfies all five properties. They contradict each other. That is by no means obvious. <laughs> uh, that is what you win Nobel Prizes for. Um, no one before had imagined that these kind of very weak conditions would contradict each other. His result 
is most commonly known as the arrow impossibility theorem. Sometimes it's known as the arrow possibility theorem, but usually it's the arrow impossibility theorem because it's showing that this kind of social decision rule is impossible. In some sense what this means is it's not possible to come up with a perfect way for society to make decisions. Or whether it's voting or you know voting in one way or voting in another way or any kind of way to do it any sort of decision making rule in society or in a committee in any uh, group of people is going to be is going to violate at least one of these five conditions so that's the error and possibility theorem now one way of describing the flaw in voting methods, we know there has to be a flaw in voting methods because of the error and possibility theorem. Voting can't be perfect. So let's discuss what the flaw in a majority voting system is. And that's what, that's what this is about. Suppose you have three voters, and this is the 1992 president, yeah, 1992 presidential election. You have Bill Clinton running against George H.W. Bush, the first President Bush, and a person named Ross Perot, a famous um, businessman who was a third party candidate. So this is the general election, and people have these choices of these three candidates. Voter one, suppose, ranks Clinton above Bush, above Perot. Voter two ranks Perot above Clinton, above Bush, and voter three ranks Bush above Pro above Clinton. So let's see the result of matchups of pairs of these candidates. Clinton versus Bush. Okay, well, voter one puts Clinton ahead of Bush. Voter two also puts Clinton ahead of Bush. Voter three puts Bush ahead of Clinton. So Clinton wins two to one. So Clinton wins. The system erasing. And the next head to head matchup is between Bush and Perot. Voter 1 ranks Bush above Perot. Voter 2 ranks Perot above Bush. And voter 3 ranks Bush above Perot. So Bush wins 2 to 1 above Perot. So what we have so far is uh, if it's Clinton versus Bush, then Clinton wins. And if it's Bush versus Perot, then Bush wins. Let me write this down. So you have Clinton versus Bush, then society picks Clinton. And you have Bush versus Perot, then society picks Bush. The third head to head pair I'm going to work on is Clinton versus Perot. Okay, so voter one, Clinton versus Perot, Clinton beats Perot. Voter two, Clinton versus Perot, Perot beats Clinton. Voter three, Clinton versus Perot, Perot beats Clinton. So Perot wins. Now if you look here, you think, well, if Clinton beats Bush and Bush beats Perot, Clinton should beat Perot, but Clinton doesn't. Clinton loses to Perot. Perot wins. Perot beats Clinton. This is a problem. This means that this method is not uh, a mathematician's way transitive. So who should win the election? It turns out that the failure of this kind of head-to-head -head majority voting rule to, to avoid this problem is because it violates the independence of irrelevant alternatives. Let me and that's what I have here. Let me give uh, down down over here. Let me give you an example of this. Suppose you have an election 
with a Democrat and two Republicans. And suppose that 40% of the people like the Democrat, 31% like Republican number one, and 29% like Republican number two. If the rule is whoever gets the most vote wins, so you don't need a majority, you just need a plurality, like for example in the Utah gubernatorial, Republican gubernatorial primary in the year 2020, uh, Spencer Cox won that primary and he got the Republican nomination for governor, which in Utah these days essentially uh, uh, guarantees that he would go on to win the general election against, the, uh, against any Democrat, and he did. Uh, he won that with much less than 50% of the vote. Spencer Cox won the, the Republican gubernatorial primary with much less than 50% of the vote because all that was required was a plurality. So in this little example I have on the lower left, suppose that you, ha you use a similar rule, use the same kind of rule, so whoever has the plurality wins, then the Democrat's going to win. Now, um, let's call, call the Democrat A, the Republican B, and Republican number 1B, Republican number 2C. So we say that, so A beats B and C, so in particular A beats B, when the choices are A, B, C. But what happens when the choices are only A and B? So what happens if Republican number two, no, Republican number two, yes, drops out? Well, if Republican number two drops out, it's reasonable to suppose that the people who used to support Republican number two are now going to throw their support to Republican number one. And Republicans in total have 60 percent of the vote in this hypothetical society. So when A goes against B, when the choices are only A and B, A is going to get 40 percent and B is going to get all of the Republican votes, so B is going to get 60 percent. And so A is going to lose to B when the choices are A and B. So you can see that this kind of decision rule violates independence of irrelevant alternatives because the, the irrelevant alternative here is Republican number two. But so, so if you're just looking at A and B, then C is irrelevant. But which one society chooses between A and B does depend on whether C is a choice or not. So C is not an uh, it's, so this decision rule is not independent of the irrelevant al this, uh, alternative. This decision rule depends on it. So that's just an example of um, uh, uh, of the flaw in this voting method. As I said, there is no perfect voting method. There is no perfect way of society making decisions. There's discussions of using in Amer for American presidential elections using and, and other elections too using ranked choice voting um, the state of California now has a system where you have nonpartisan elections so uh, for the primary election all the Democrats run against all the Republicans and then the top two people go on to the general election so you could have two Democrats in the general election you could have two Republicans um, running against each other in the general election. So there are lots of different ways of 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 having majority of of having democratic elections. Um, you can have situations where the legislature is divided. If, if one political party gets twenty percent of the vote, then they get twenty percent of the seats in the legislature. Um, that's not the way that the U.S. does it. It's not the way that the United Kingdom does it, but it is the way that it's done to some extent in Germany and to a very great extent in Israel. Um, so there are lots of different ways of voting, and none of them are perfect. In general, there are lots of different ways of making social decisions, and none of them are perfect. So our next topic, the topic of the next video, is going to be what, what are we going to do in this class? What do economists do when they recommend a, a policy for society, an environmental policy for society? So that's the topic of the next video.